They are the shadow hand of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the keeper and trusted guardian of Iran's spiderweb of alliances and proxy forces around the world. Specializing in both military intelligence and in unconventional asymmetrical warfare, they have maintained a presence in some of the world's most intractable hot zones as perhaps the most dangerous head of the Hydra that is Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. Depending on who you ask around the world, they may well be devils or they may well be saviors. They are Iran's Quds Force, reporting directly directly to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, and at present, they are among the most ruthless and feared special operations forces on Earth. In today's installment of our Special Operators series, we'll tackle the especially thorny issue of the Quds Force, their history, their modus operandi, and some of the operations that have gained them notoriety around the world. When the Islamic Revolution of 1978 and 1979 took hold of Iran, it set off a cascade of events that would see Iran's pro-Western Shah deposed and convert the nation itself from a relatively secular state to a theocracy. Under Ayatollah Rahala Khomeini, who would lead his new Islamic Republic for its first decade of existence, Iran purged itself of holdouts from the old regime, obliterated its former alliances and friendships with the West, and undertook a cultural revolution that was meant to orient the entire nation, its institutions, and its society around the Ayatollah's revolutionary version of Islam. But before long, Iran would find itself at war, beating back an invasion from Saddam Hussein's neighboring Iraq and kicking off a broader conflict that would last from 1981 to 1989. It was from inside this crucible that the Islamic Republic began to build not just its conventional military, but a military with all the bells, whistles, and extra capabilities that would help Iran to defeat Iraq and become a major regional power during the Cold War. During the war, the number of organizations tried to take a leading role in developing Iran's capacity for extraterritorial operations. That is to say, their ability to wage war, carry out attacks, and operate covertly on foreign soil. The Irregular Warfare Headquarters, the Lebanon Guard, and the Asymmetrical Warfare Specialists in the Ramizan Group each made their best attempts, with varying levels of success, and each one helped Iran to accumulate valuable experience in guerrilla warfare. But it was all of them together that would eventually form the Quds Force. When the Iran-Iraq War ended in 1989, Iran took the opportunity to reorganize and standardize its military. By order of Iran's president at the time, the country's asymmetrical warfare forces were unified under a single command, one that would operate as an independent branch of the Iranian military, the Revolutionary Guard Corps. This new branch was named the Quds Force, translating directly to Jerusalem Force, in keeping with what the Quds Force's original mission was meant to be. Operating as an intelligence and unconventional warfare group, something like a combination of the American Green Berets and the CIA, the Quds Force's stated mission would be to liberate what the Ayatollah considered to be Muslim lands, especially Jerusalem. The Quds Force assembled the surviving members of each of Iran's prior unconventional warfare forces under a series of commanders answering directly to the Ayatollah. One of the group's predecessors, also known as the Quds Force, but don't worry about that, had set up relationships with the mostly Shia militia known as Hezbollah, which it had helped to set up in Lebanon. Hezbollah was, and still is, a sort of imitation revolutionary group in the same ideological vein as the Iranian Revolution had been, and it became the first in a long list of partner organizations for the new Quds Force, who orchestrated training for its fighters and guided the flow of weapons, material, and funding as a sponsor. Around the same time, the Quds Force started backing an Afghan opposition movement known as Hebzawar Hat, which was hard at work as one of the major factions resisting Soviet occupation during the Afghan Civil War. When the Taliban, a Sunni Muslim organization, took control of Afghanistan and declared an Islamic Emirate in 1996, Iran sent its support to the new opposition group in Afghanistan called the Northern Alliance and spent significant wealth and human capital trying to prop up the resistance for another five years. During those same years, Iranian officers led and trained Iraq's Bada Brigade, a Shia militia made up of Iraqi refugees and defectors who occasionally forayed back into Iraq to resist Saddam Hussein. In this period, a number of future Iranian leaders cut their teeth as a direct or indirect part of the Quds Force's efforts abroad, but none would become quite so prominent as Qasem Soleimani. 
A veteran of the Iran-Iraq War and an early supporter of the Iranian Revolution, Soleimani had become a brigadier general by the war's end. After a few years dealing with drug cartels in Iran's southeast, Soleimani became an integral part of Iran's attempts to assist the Afghan Northern Alliance, and before long he had distinguished himself enough that he was appointed commander of the Quds Force. In the following years, Qasem Soleimani became synonymous with the Quds Force's work, their reputation, and their rapidly evolving capabilities. It was under Soleimani's command that the Quds Force evolved from an active but fairly standard enforcer unit sending detachments to aid their allies in war zones to an elite unit with capabilities that mirrored American, Soviet, and European covert ops. Soleimani redoubled the Quds Force's support of Hezbollah in Lebanon and began to ally themselves with Palestinian resistance groups like Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, setting up proxy groups within striking distance to the Israeli-held territories that the Iranian regime coveted. With this sort of approach, Iran was able to develop a robust patronage network in the region, not becoming a patron for any other recognized nation, but focusing on non-state actors who had the greatest chance of recreating an Iran-style Islamic revolution in their own country countries. The Quds Force got its first chance to assert itself on the world stage in 2003 after the United States launched its invasion of Iraq in 2003. From the start of the conflict, the Quds Force pivoted into support for Shia militias, including not only its previous ally in the Bada Brigade, but a number of other scattered resistance sects across the country. During the war, Iran was infamously labeled part of an axis of evil by US President George W. Bush and accused of providing those same Shia militias with the materials and training required to make roadside and Provised explosive devices, or IEDs. In the following years, successive U.S. administrations have blamed the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and thus their primary international operators, the Quds Force, for the death of hundreds of U.S. troops in Iraq during the invasion years. And the experience that Quds operators and their Iraqi allies would pick up during the U.S. occupation was put to use a few years later in 2011's Arab Spring. Many of the early casualties over the Arab Spring weren't much of a problem for Iran. Tunisia's ousted president, Ben Ali, had led a Sunni government, and so had Egypt's Hosni Mubarak, who had long stoked tensions with accusations that Shia Muslims in many Arab nations held a secret allegiance to Iran rather than their own countries. In fact, not only were those revolts not a problem, but they offered opportunities for the Quds Force to start working toward resolutions and new governments that favored them. But when the uprisings made their way to Syria, where Alawite Shia leader Bashar al-Assad and his minority government began to face resistance from the country's Sunni majority, it marked a shift toward the sort of regional destabilization that the Quds Force was built to prevent. Although they initially deployed to Syria on the pretext of protecting Shiite shrines from violence, the Quds Force actually entered the conflict with the intent of supporting the Assad regime. They did it not just by suppressing dissenters, not just by advising the Syrian military on how to proceed, but by sending their own forward operators to the front lines and sending substantial manpower from the Quds Force's militias in other countries. Iraqi battle fighters, Hezbollah fighters from Lebanon, and armed, experienced Afghan combat veterans began streaming into Syria. And when Yemen started to go down the tubes in the same way, the Quds Force dispatched operatives to support the country's Houthi rebels. Those rebels, by the way, were fighting a government backed by Iran's major Arab rival, Saudi Arabia. The Quds Force only redoubled its efforts in response to the rise of the Islamic State, an extremist but still very sunny sect, and it was Iraqis' militias backed by the Quds Force, not Iraqi government troops, who had the greatest success taking back territory from them. But just as had been true with the George W. Bush administration a decade earlier, the story of the Quds Force in recent days cannot be told without the United States. In Iraq, the Quds Force's militias relied on airstrikes from the US-led coalition fighting the Islamic State, and so too did the US rely on the Quds Force's militias to take ground targets without risking American soldiers. But after the Islamic State's downfall, the US and Iran's animosity was not so easily forgotten, and the Quds Force was a prime target for the sort of messages America wanted to be sending. In January 2020, Qasem Soleimani himself was killed in a U.S. airstrike, and the Quds Force has spent the past several years with the dubious honor of being the first and only state security agency to have ended up on the U.S.'s list of foreign terrorist organizations. The 
The CUDS force is organized into eight directorates, each of which is responsible for managing CUDS operations in a different geographical region. Two directorates handle individual countries, Iran's next-door neighbors, Iraq and Turkey. One is meant to deal with Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, while another focuses on Israel, Lebanon, and Jordan. The Arabian Peninsula and North Africa each have their own CUDS directorates, and Europe, the United States, and Canada are unified under a directorate, while the same is done with Russia and the other former Soviet states. Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, East Asia and Australia are generally spared their attention. In addition to its eight directorates, the CUDS force is stratified into five operational branches – intelligence, finance, politics, sabotage, and special operations. Each of these branches is assigned its own commander, with operatives from each of the five branches being assigned to one of the many directorates worldwide. At least from the outside, factional rivalries between these branches appear to be muted. They are all orientated directly under the Quds Forces commander until recently Qasem Soleimani, and they coordinate a long list of support operations in concert with each other. Unlike some of uh, the more provocative figures of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Quds Force prefers to act quietly and avoid international attention when possible. It's difficult to put a finger on just how large the Quds Force actually is. Conservative estimates can be as low as two to 3,000, with under 1,000 actual operatives around the world, while the more generous estimates can rise as high as 50,000. Wherever an analyst falls on that sliding scale is likely to bias assessments of what the group is and what it does. If it's made up of a small handful of operatives, then one might assume that those agents are meant to be highly capable, generalist solo operators sneaking into war zones by themselves or in small teams and running things from the shadows. If it's made up of tens of thousands of personnel, then it might make more sense to interpret the CUDS force as a diversified array of specialists, support staff, and hidden large bases or frontline squads around the world. Either way, Iran ain't telling. What we do know is that the Quds Force retains some of its agents in order to train and oversee foreign assets, similar to global intelligence services like MI6 or the CIA. Others are meant to serve in combat roles as frontline shock troops, saboteurs, or insurgent leaders. Their personnel are often in flux. Talented troops from elsewhere in the Revolutionary Guard Corps might be pulled into a Quds Force operation, as might any of their regional partners in the nations where they do their work. But the mission is generally the same. To maintain Iran's proxy forces around the world and ensure that they're in the best shape possible to fight back against their national regimes. In this sense, it's especially important to note that despite interest from the US and the broader West in rooting out the Quds Force's influence, the Quds Force themselves don't appear to be particularly interested in direct confrontations with those nations. Instead, they prefer a decades-long approach meant to slowly but surely extend their influence into the surrounding nations and ensure that every time there's a push or pull in those societies, the Quds Force can move one step closer to ensuring that the next upheaval or revolution will fall in their favor. They do so by leveraging not just impressive amounts of financial capital, more than many of their proxy organizations could ever make on their own, but by orchestrating the transfer of some pretty heavy-duty weaponry. Unmanned aircraft, air defense systems, cruise missiles, and armor-piercing ammunition, alongside a long list of other things these proxy groups would otherwise never get their hands on. These days, the Quds Force is led by General Ismail Khani, whose longtime friendship with Soleimani, going as far back as the Iran-Iraq War, saw him serve as deputy commander during Soleimani's entire tenure. An expert in the Quds Force's financial operations and their network of monetary support worldwide, Khani had also been responsible for training some of the most successful Shia brigades in Syria, and while Western analysts are split on just how much of a change Khani will have on the organization, he's generally seen as being a smoothly competent, ruthlessly efficient leader in keeping with the Quds Force's formidable reputation. Now, unfortunately, we can't delve into our usual section about how one becomes a member of X Special Operations Force. It's probably no surprise to learn that the Quds Force isn't interested in giving that sort of knowledge away. We do know that the Quds Force selects its personnel partly due to their skill in serving other branches of the Revolutionary Guard Corps. But just as important as their service record is their ideological alliance to the Islamic Revolution of Iran. And we know that whatever the Quds Force's training is, it's got to be pretty good. The group's operatives are combat-tested, and so are the militias and resistance organizations that they train. As much as the Quds Force's track record has been a thorn in the side of the US, Europe, and a long list of Middle Eastern regimes, well, you certainly can't say they aren't effective. So we've already hit on the major inflection points across the short 
but very busy history of the Cud's force. But it's about time we take a closer look at some of the operations that the group is either confirmed to have carried out or is suspected to have taken part in. First, there's the extent to which they are willing to go to to back up their international proxies. A story that tends to rhyme from country to country, but for brevity's sake, we'll focus on one. Yemen's Houthi rebels. Although Iran took several years to confirm that it had even minimally assisted the Houthis, the true extent of its cooperation is believed to have gone far deeper. The Quds force is believed to have supplied military advisors to help train and coordinate the rebels, sent plans and technology to aid the manufacturing of weapons, provided crucial intelligence to guide rebel attacks with drones, missiles, and ground troops, and directed those attacks to target Saudi Arabia and its oil fields, as well as the Yemeni government. The Quds force has been accused of facilitating the transport of heavy anti-tank weaponry, explosives, of drones and even long-range ballistic missiles. And in 2022, some of the financial ties between the two groups were exposed by US intelligence, attesting to transfers of tens of millions of dollars or more. Then there's the Quds Force's proclivity to plan and engage in assassination, and perhaps no example stands out better than the one involving one slightly unhinged but undeniably well-mustachioed American named John Bolton. As was revealed by a spokesperson for the U.S. Department of Justice in 2022, Cud's force attempted to recruit an assassin on U.S. soil to kill Bolton, who had previously served as national security advisor to Donald Trump, making him a particularly likely person to have privately advocated for Trump's approval of the strike that killed Qasem Soleimani two years prior. The attack was never carried out, but the threat was considered severe enough that Bolton was granted a full-time Secret Service detail despite being well out of government by the time the plot was uncovered. Covered. Also in assassination news, the Quds forces had been implicated a decade earlier in a plot to kill Saudi Arabia's then ambassador to the United States. The assassination, planned by a Quds force operative named Ghalem Shakuri and an Iranian-American associate, would have involved hiring members of an international drug cartel to blow up the ambassador at a busy restaurant. Luckily for the ambassador, this assassination attempt was also foiled, but the Quds force operative who orchestrated it was never apprehended. And these two plots are by no means the only time when the Quds force was believed to have been planning assassinations, targeted killings are a favorite tool of the group and have been planned or carried out on nearly every continent. And finally, it's worth going deeper on the support that Quds force has shown to the Assad regime in Syria, even as the Assad family has directly perpetrated some of the most despicable crimes against humanity since World War II. By the way, if you don't believe us, do check out our video on Sadnaya prison on our sister channel into the shadows, it's an eye-opener. As we mentioned before, the Quds Force has assisted Assad by sending its Shia proxy militias into the conflict from Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. But they've done quite a lot more than that. Iran has been instrumental in keeping the Assad regime well supplied by air, and they've been accused of exploiting the Iranian Red Crescent organization, equivalent to the Red Cross, to smuggle material and personnel into Syria without interdiction. Quds force teams have been dispatched on the ground during much of the war, assisting not just with troop training, but intelligence gathering on Syria's behalf. The total amount of money Iran has sent to support Syria is estimated to be, at a minimum, in the tens of billions. So as we look to the future, it's hard to deny that Iran and the Quds force are likely to step up their operations rather than draw them down. In Lebanon, the Quds-trained Hezbollah organization is gaining more and more legitimacy. In Yemen, their Houthi proxies are on the verge of a political settlement to finally end their civil war. The largest political bloc in Iraq's parliament is Shia, and in Syria, the Assad regime is poised to finalize a near total victory in the coming years. What this means, like it or not, is that Iran's strategy of backing up its Shia proxies in the Middle East appears to be working, and with rising tensions between Iran and the new Taliban government in Afghanistan, it's not hard to imagine where new militias might start popping up next. Furthermore, we must remember that the Quds Force's ultimate objective is the liberation, as they see it, of occupied Muslim lands. Now that the nation Iran sees as its greatest regional enemy, Israel is beginning to ally itself with the region's major Sunni power, Saudi Arabia, more and more fuel is being poured onto an already burning fire around Iran's nuclear program and the situation in Palestine. Now, of course, this is the Middle East we're talking about, and in this part of the world, concrete predictions about what comes next aren't worth the paper they're printed on. But what we can say 
is that the Quds forces will be an instrumental part of Iran's next moves. They will infiltrate. They will spy. They will cultivate their assets abroad. And when the time is right, they will supply the training camps, material, and critical knowledge that their proxies will need. With the Quds force acting as Iran's shadow hand, the nation may well continue to rise in its regional influence. And where that leads, we'll just have to wait to find out.